this is this is about smart cities, but this is a different angle. This is almost the low tech version of smart cities. Uh, I was interested in writing the book, The Temporary City, uh, to examine this whole field of temporary urbanism. Uh, and this is a move away, a move away from the traditional approach of city policy making, uh, rigid, hard-edged master plans, to look at the process, the process of change, uh, and how we can start to use the process of change to improve cities, to create wealth, uh, create progress. In a time of very, very uh, major change, major uncertainty, and major risk in both the political, the economic, and the social environment. Uh, and in writing a book on temporary urbanism, I was interested in some of these questions, really. Uh, first of all, when we know, whether you're a quantum physicist or a Buddhist, that everything in life is temporary, why are we so obsessed in architectural education and in practice in permanence? in an end state. Uh, if there is a movement towards temporary urbanism, uh, what are the changes, what are the forces that are driving it? Uh, is this a manifestation of a more dynamic and flexible approach to managing and changing and shaping our cities? And finally, if so, uh, what kind of planning systems, what kind of governance systems do we need to take advantage of this? And these are the kind of questions I hope to cover briefly in the next 20 minutes. Uh, but first of all, one of the problems of writing about temporary urbanism is you only know it's temporary when it's gone, which makes it extremely hard to study. Uh, and therefore, I defined it, actually, that temporary urbanism is an intentional stage. Whether it be one night, one week, one year, or 20 years, if the intention is it's temporary, and is part of a process that leads somewhere, then that, to me, is a definition of temporary urbanism. Uh, and the paradox is that despite the fact that we're trained to think about end state, uh, we know the city is layered. We know the cities evolve. Uh, we know the cities adapt and preserve, as in the Roman amphitheater here in Lucca, uh, the memories. Uh, and we know that the cities that we operate in as practitioners uh, will continue to evolve long after we've packed up our pens and moved on to other areas. And I was particularly taken by the work of Zygmunt Bauman, a Polish sociologist, uh, philosopher, uh, who talks about liquid modernity. Uh, he contrasts the 20th century, uh, where we believe that with empirical data, with enough data, we could control, we could plan uh, over a long period with the 21st century, where he talks about liquid modernity, where nothing stays solid enough for long enough. Things change so rapidly. The set of plans, either as institutions or as individuals, we have to adopt strategies, and we have to adapt, and we have to change. And his ideas are translated into the times that we live in today, around the huge economic turmoil that Europe has been undergoing for the last four and a half, five years. And in particular, underneath that, the fundamental changes in the way in which we live our lives, uh, the revolution in work, the impact of technology and communications technology, that if you work in the fields that we all work in, in this room, uh, you're never working, you're never not working, your location is where you are, you carry your entire office in your in your bag, in your suitcase, sometimes in your pocket. And that's completely changing the nature of location and the way in which we use our cities. And underneath this, this huge booming of this thing called the creative milieu, uh, the idea that uh, the economic future of Europe isn't in the traditional manufacturing fields. It's around the creative industries where you add very, very high value whether that be designing fashion, or buildings, or financial services. And increasingly, cities are very, very interested in strategies that attract in the creative industries. That's where the high value is. That's where wealth is created. And those are the uh, 
areas the city managers are now desperately, and politicians, desperately trying to bring in to their cities. Um, and underneath this, this whole pop-up meanwhile phenomenon, uh, it's difficult to pick up a newspaper without there being a pop-up restaurant, a pop-up cafe, a pop-up theatre. Uh, and this whole uh, approach that we no longer see pieces of our cities as being necessarily permanent infrastructure, but they can be temporary. And not, on, on, not only are they temporary, but actually that temporariness is part of the extraordinary vitality that our cities can bring. Uh, and that temporariness can generate a huge amount of potential economic benefit. And just a few examples. I mean, this is an obvious one. This is the biggest temporary event you could possibly hold. This is the Olympic Games in London. Uh, for three, three weeks, uh, three and a half weeks, we held a Games and constructed a whole piece of city around it, which is then later dismantled and turned into something else. That's a temporary event. Uh, this is another temporary event. Uh, this is the Autobahn just north of Cologne uh, on a Sunday. Uh, and the interesting thing about temporariness is it moves in all sorts of different scales. And I think in a very exciting way, it changes our attitude as to how we use infrastructure. Uh, another example uh, of how we use infrastructure, this is the work of Rebar, a San Francisco collective, uh, architectural collective, uh, where in the morning they put so many dollars in the parking meter, and instead of parking their car, they've rented the space. They lay it out as a garden for the day. When the meter expires, they pack it up and move on to the next one. Uh, recreation. Uh, this is uh, Frank's Bar. This was set up for the summer on the top of a car park in southeast London. Uh, it operates as a bar, and it cost 7,000 euros to construct and ran at a reasonable profit, but actually produced a new centre in an area that desperately needed to attract regeneration. Uh, there are ways in which you can rethink the use of space. This is Essen. This is the flying green carpet by Studio Eddy. And it's an example where a very, very simple intervention can completely change the way in which a space is used for a period of time. At the end of the period, this is rolled up and moved on to another venue to transform another space for events. Uh, and then finally, uh, in the kind of fractured political environment that we operate in, uh, citizen empowerment. People are now beginning to move in and actually take control of pieces of cities. This is Toronto. Uh, this is uh, guerrilla bike lanes, uh, where cyclists decided just to lay out their own cycle lanes because the city had failed to do it. And it's a characteristic of the fact that the fragmentation of government in power is now beginning to produce completely different approaches to the way in which cities are managed and developed. So the sort of question I want to look at briefly is, how do we plan this? What works? If we think this is a good thing, open question, if politicians believe the creative uh, industries of a new power, if we believe that temporary activity adds life and vitality to our cities, how do we do it? Well, I suppose the easy question is, actually, don't try too hard. Uh, city government, and I've worked in city government for a long part of my career, is not very good at this. The best thing city government can do is try not to do very much. Zones of tolerance, uh, pieces of the city where you pull back a bit. As long as it's legal, let people do it. Don't overregulate it. And actually, you'll find that most cities, most mature cities, actually have these zones of tolerance, where people keep gardens, grow vegetables, have workshops. And these are actually really interesting seedbeds for creativity. And you'll also find that a lot of cities now are beginning to develop these inner edges. This is London again. This is Shoreditch. You can just see in the background one of the new office towers of the central business, the city of London, the central business district. And around this in Shoreditch, a huge concentration of creative industries. And this is a uh, simple piece of architecture. Uh, these are design workshops using old railway carriages and London tube system, along with a piece of graffiti, along with a public space. And these areas are acting as huge and interesting seedbeds for the regeneration of economies in cities. Uh, the private sector 
has also been extremely successful, actually more successful possibly in the public sector, in understanding the power of temporary interventions. Uh, this is uh, an example, this is London South Bank. This is a temporary installation which is now 25 years old, looking rather permanent, but it's still temporary. Uh, and this is about using a space run by a co-op on the South Bank Walk to actually generate money, uh, which has now become so successful, it's likely to stay there for quite a long time. Uh, the big marketing firms are now getting into the idea of pop-ups. Uh, on the right is the Hermes pop-up. Uh, recently, Nike had a pop-up in New York where if you were smart enough to know about it and in with the right networks, you earned the privilege to buy a pair of trainers for about $300 at this shop on one day only. And the marketing people begin to realize it's a kind of false exclusivity in a world where everything is mass produced and everything is the same. So the, the marketing people are really beginning to understand the idea of pop-ups and the idea of points of time that give an, exclusiv an exclusivity to a particular product. Uh, business is understanding it. Uh, this is a business improvement district in London uh, where the businesses have actually put money in to set up a pop-up workshop space as part of their return to their business community to help subsidize and encourage new startups and new firms. Uh, Co companies are now increasingly using artists to occupy space while it's waiting development. This is a company called Oubliette Art House that runs theatre, cinema and artist studios. Uh, it means the space is occupied, you save on security costs, you save on running costs and it's returned to you if you've got a good tenant like uh, the art house here actually in better condition than when they occupied it. Uh, and then a final set of examples where developers have done it, actually to establish location and build political capital. This is a development site, again, in the, just south of the river in London. Uh, it's quite a long way off development, but the owner, uh, four years ago, sponsored in the summer a Lido, a swimming pool, and then two years ago turned the same site into a garden center. And at the end of the summer, donated all of the plants to the kind of rather run-down municipal housing area at the back. And this is about building a relationship with your community as a developer, which actually pays off in terms of a better relationship, easier planning, easier regulation uh, when you come to develop. Uh, and these are a couple of slides from the King's Cross development, which I worked on. Uh, this is a skip garden. It's run by a local collective. It moves around the site as development happens and the produce is sold to the canteen of the Guardian newspaper, almost the perfect virtuous circle. Uh, another example is a temporary theatre space uh, set up with the Sadler's Wells Ballet Company, uh, which ran a series of extraordinary ballet and theatre events uh, two summers ago. And this actually is about establishing location. Uh, the developers Argent recognise that the by occupying the space, by drawing people in, by saying to people, this is your future piece of city, they establish location, and that translates into market position and ultimately into your ability to develop uh, and lease property. Uh, another example from a developer, uh, again in London, this is uh, difficult to see, but this is another railway carriage on a bit of railway line uh, funded by the developer in a rather poor area of London. Uh, the developer is building upmarket housing. But this is a deliberate attempt to provide something, to uh, give something back. It's a cafe. It's a children's creche. It spills out in the evenings to become a cinema. And actually, it's the point of communication between the community and the developer. And as the development uh, progresses, this will be moved around the site as a truly temporary and mobile uh, facility. And then finally, on the micro scale, it's getting people involved to celebrate their own particular uh, customs, their own particular approach. And this is uh, just painting on the King's Cross scheme 
uh, traditional designs from the local ben Bengali community as a way of actually opening a bridge to invite people in to participate in a constructive as opposed to a, as opposed to a negative dialogue about what development can bring. Uh, so, if these are the approaches, uh, cities are now really beginning to engage in a very, very exciting way with it. Uh, this could be a two-hour lecture in its own right, but just a couple of examples. Obviously, you know, the Olympics was you know, an example of the temporary event which operated last summer in London, uh, which was deliberately then transferred into a legacy. And this on the left shows the problem of the Olympics. It's an enclosed specialist ca sports campus. And the proposal is to blast it out to become an organic piece of city and create in London, at the end of it, a legacy, a piece of city which will, will, will regenerate one of the poorest areas and some of the poorest communities. And this is an example of a very, very deliberate city-initiated strategy using a big temporary event to achieve long-term change. <coughs> this is a completely different approach in Amsterdam, the NDSM Wharf. Uh, this was an area of declining uh, riverside industry and warehousing. Uh, it was squatted. Uh, and North Amsterdam made a very, very brave decision to actually work with the squatters. Uh, they recognized that the traditional regeneration approaches around blue-collar industry and warehousing wasn't going to work anymore. Uh, and they allowed the uh, informal use of the wharf to develop. They changed some of the zoning to facilitate it. Uh, and recently, uh, and you can argue whether this is a sign of success or failure, but MTV have just moved in and taken a large plot and are developing this for their headquarters because they can see this is an edgy, exciting piece of city that they want to be involved in. And there's cities like Detroit, uh, Detroit uh, in the 1980s had a population of two and a quarter million, is now 750,000. The city has declined rapidly, it's hollowed out. And the city is now demolishing parts of the inner city and laying it out for urban agriculture as a way of just trying to produce some kind of production and remove the scars of dereliction. And then finally, Christchurch. This is uh, Christchurch. Uh, severely damaged by an earthquake about 18 months ago. Uh, and here they used a very, very simple strategy, a temporary city center. They rebuilt the city center, not just to provide a place very, very quickly, uh, as opposed to a set of ruins until they get around to the long-term development, uh, but also, uh, apart from rebuilding it physically and economically, also rebuilding it socially. And it's been hugely successful in allowing a severely traumatized city to take control of its own future and reestablish its civic infrastructure through temporary uses. So finally, I'm just going to look at how we do this in planning terms. And I think it means going way beyond the traditional master plan approach to urban change. Uh, this is a project which uh, I was involved in, uh, the Allies of Morrison Master Plan for the King's Cross Scheme. It looks like a traditional master plan. Uh, it has streets, it has buildings, it has blocks. Actually, it's a very, very flexible approach based on a loose vision. There is a clear statement as to where the building blocks are, but the actual development is left to be adapted according to market circumstances. This far more flexible approach based on vision is the reason why this master plan underpinned the King's Cross development. Uh, and despite the worst, recession, worst property recession that we've ever experienced, King's Cross is one of the few sites that built throughout the recession and actually is now ahead of schedule as to where we thought it would be in 2006 before the recession hit. Uh, not only that, but actually what's being built is actually completely recognized, recognizable, but different from the original plan. Uh, and then secondly, sort of even looser master plans, the idea of incremental master plans. So you have an idea what a place might be like in about 20 years' time. You identify a series of opportunities. You key in potential funding, 
Uh, you develop the area incrementally. Uh, you develop it site by site. As the money, as the opportunity arises, you know where you're going. You're not quite sure on the journey. Even if you do three quarters of it and never complete it, you still produce a piece of city that's considerably better than waiting to have the entire funding and the legislation available to tackle it in one go. And once you get into this, it changes the ways in which, as an architect and as a designer, you think about your profession. Uh, it's no longer about drawing plans. It's no longer about spatial thinking. Uh, it does involve design. It does involve plans. But it also involves a, an approach to how you curate, uh, how you choreograph pieces of city, how you stimulate change alongside your physical plans. And once you've done it, how you manage it. And I think one of the most interesting things about urbanism now is the extent to which the blurring of the disciplines between the professions is happening. And the most creative work is happening when master planning and architects move way outside their field and start to think about a long-term relationship with the city to make their plans happen and, if needs be, adapt it. Uh, and this is just a kind of, to finish, uh, a scheme we're working on at the moment, uh, working on at the moment on the Olympic Park in London. And on the left is a kind of graphic, which I don't know how well you can see it, but at the top, it's how we used to see it. You did temporary things until you could do something permanent. And the temporary things were just one step. And they weren't that good because you really want to do something permanent. At the, bot the bottom graphic is actually it's a lot more subtle than that. Uh, temporary uses allow you to get stuck in, allow you to start, allow you to experiment, allow you to prototype, allows you to communicate with local communities and say, that's a great idea, let's just go and do that, let's do it on Saturday, as opposed to we're doing it in three years' time. Uh, and the temporary uses have a life of their own. They distort where you might be going. Some of them become so successful, they spin off into other locations. Others may stay permanently, permanently on site. Others may move you into a far more interesting direction than you may have thought. And on the right is our first graphic for thinking about how we use temporary uses to reopen the Olympic Park in London, which reopens on the 27th of July this year. We've established a temporary use on the edge, and we're going to spin out satellites of activities to persuade people, to tempt them, that they can move into the park and take it back as a piece of their city. Uh, and in so doing, we've taken each activity. So there's an activity at the top left about if, for example, you wanted to have a small sports use, how that operates during the day, how it operates during the week, how it operates during the year, and then superimposing on the right-hand side several activities to so think about how uh, you manage the city, how you overlap uses, how you curate the interest. And again, to use the analogy, it's a bit like curating an exhibition or choreographing a sophisticated dance through the city to create a far richer approach to process which will lead you towards the end. Uh, this is the site, and in developing it, we've thought of it increasingly like a stage set. Uh, and one of those kind of fantastic bits of theatre where you go in and you take a seat and the stage is completely empty. It's blank. But you know that underneath it, there are turntables, there are trapdoors, and there are sliders for scenery to come on. And increasingly, we're starting to think about how we design the platforms and the infrastructure upon which you can build temporary pieces of city, a bit like theatre, moving stages and stage pieces on and off as it develops. So that's it. Uh, just in conclusion, I suppose it's now about thinking in four dimensions. We've always talked about architecture being a three dimension, but thinking in three dimensions actually is four dimensions. It's the time sequences that make it, I think, far more interesting. And in an uncertain world where we no longer have control over long-term funding, where there's not necessarily political consensus, and where things can change very, very rapidly, 
Temporary urbanism is about doing something now, doing something which is achievable, and thinking of planning and architecture as a process that can build consensus, that can adapt, that can generate value, and that can establish location, and critically, reduce risk, both political risk from a city government point of view and development risk from a private sector point of view. And in so doing, create bits of city which are just delightful and fun and brilliant places to be. And oh, as I'm here, the book The Temporary City is available through Amazon, published by Rutledge. But thanks very much for your attention.